Romans chapter 6. I'm sorry, open up to Romans chapter 8 first. Romans 8, verse 26. And you can keep your Bible handy tonight. We'll just read a set of scriptures and then let you be seated. And then um, just like to go through uh, Romans a little bit together. And if you would keep me in prayer next week, I've got a little sinus surgery that they're going to do to kind of laugh because as big as my nose is, um, I don't breathe too well out of it, so they're going to go in and try to help that, so um, just pray for me, and and uh, I, I don't plan on staying away, I, I will have to miss a couple services there at the beginning, but um, they tell me I look like I got busted in the face, so if you see me, just um, question Tiff. <laughs> Romans 8, 26. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and them who he justified, them he also glorified. Lord, bless his word tonight. You can be seated. And if you want to turn back to uh, chapter 6, I'm going to skip around a little bit, but um, something that just caught my attention here in the scripture was, was how much the, just kind of in that thought, I get so imp- impressed and and it's just so overwhelming to think about how much the Lord loves you and I and, and the fact that He would leave glory and come down to have fellowship with us and to, and to go to the cross for, for you and me to endure that pain and that suffering and, and all, all, all for me and for you. And, and, you know, if we think about our lives, we think how poorly we've treated Him in response to that um, but he knew that we would be sinners. He knew that that would be that way. And so it wasn't just enough to go to the cross and die for us, but he wanted to send his spirit. And here in Romans chapter 8, he's talking about, it's, he says the spirit helps our infirmities. It's the spirit that makes intercession for the saints. It's the spirit that does these things. It's the spirit. It's the spirit. And so I want you to catch that as we go tonight. But just stepping back a little bit, um, If you want to sometime read Romans 6, 7, and 8, uh, I just think it's a real good thing. But, you know, especially for the young ones, if they're considering baptism, young or old, if you haven't ever been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, um, read chapter 6, verse 1 through 11. It's a good good, uh, uh, picture of what water baptism signifies in, in the believer's life and and I just think it's real good talking about, you know, how we, we die to sin, how Christ died for us, and we rise again in newness of life. And, you know, I always say he got the short end of the stick, really. Um, but I guess to him, he got the better end because he got us. So, amen. So let's just pick it up in verse 12. And Paul writes here, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instrument of righteousness unto God. So Paul's actually saying you have a part to play in this, and it's just simply who you yield to. What do you yield yourself to? What are you, what are you allowing yourself to partake in? God, God made these bodies. Brother Paul was saying it on Sunday. God, God is, is the absolute principal theme of the Scripture, so He should be the principal theme of our life. 
And, and the scripture talks about it. everything was made by him and for him. And if we were made by him and for him, to me, just common sense would say we should be giving ourselves back to him. Yield yourself. Yield your vessel. And, and you know, oftentimes, you know, it's, it's we make yielding a lot more difficult than what it is. Yielding is just giving, giving over. What are, you self, what are you giving yourself to? That's a, it's just that simple. And we can complicate it and we can make it as, as, you know, all kinds of things. But it's just, what are you giving yourself to? For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but you're under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. The prophet said one time, he said, if you could be given a chance to have one night and just go out and do whatever you want, and it wouldn't be held to your account. He said, if you say, I, well, I would go out and I would tear up the town, he said, you got the wrong spirit. Even if you had the absolute freedom to go and do whatever you want to do, and that thing would not be held against you in the eyes of God, I would still want to live for him. Amen? And that should be the desire in the believer's heart because when you realize what God did for you, it's, it's all you can do to give back to Him the best you can. We fail? Absolutely. We absolutely fail. We're in these bodies of flesh. We're going to find this out here as we read. But God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servant to obey, his servant ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. So if you want to know, are you of God, who are you, who are you yielding your vessel to? Who are you choosing to obey? Amen? So let's jump ahead here to chapter 7 and verse 7. And like I said, I'm going to be skipping around, so just, just hang with me. I'm hoping after that surgery, I don't sound so nasally when I talk, too. <laughs> What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concup concupiscence, however you say that. Basically, it means lust. For without the law, sin was dead. Now let's go to verse 11. We're just laying a foundation here. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. So sin will actually take what's right and use it against you. It'll cause you to sin. So all through Romans 6 and 7 here, Paul's, Paul's laying out, basically to me as I read it, it was, it was a war within himself. And he writes how knowing the law brought that war, and I believe that the war is present with us today. This, this war doesn't change. It actually, at some point in our lives, I feel like each of us have this war within us, different seasons of our lives, with and without the Holy Ghost. This war is, is, is ever present with us because we're bodies of flesh. So Paul's actually saying there was no knowledge of sin without the law. So before the law, he actually says there was, basically he says there was no sin because there was no mind of sin. There was, there was nothing to say, hey, this is sinful. There was nothing to say, hey, this is right and this is wrong. It was just, I, I, I just love what, what that, that revelation that Brother Paul brought on Sunday that, you know, Adam and Eve didn't need to know right and wrong. That was all in God. And that took care of it all. But then man wanted a part to play, and so God gave us the law, and in comes the, 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 the sin, the, the good and evil. So before that, there was no knowledge of it, which is why the law is what condemns us to death, and yet exposes sin as the death-causing, life-ruining attribute of the devil that it is. So it's almost like a double-edged sword to it. You know, there's, there's, it seems like, well, there's a good side to the law, and then it seems like, well, there's a bad side to the law. So, you know, really, you know, you could in your mind say, well, then let's do away with the law. Well, that's not the right answer either. 
you get in trouble. Paul writes that the law has no power in and of itself and is what makes us miserable when we know it by letter, but without the Spirit. So many sit in churches for years, including message churches. I had even message churches, and I thought, I'm not trying to sound snobby. You know, we're not, well, even message churches. No, any church, doesn't matter who you are, you're sin-born flesh. I don't care what church you sit in. I don't care what the name is on the door. I don't care what preach, what's preached in that church. You're, you're sin-born flesh. So we can sit in the churches, and, and oftentimes as young people, we do. We sit in church, we hear the word, we hear the, the pure, revealed word of the hour, and we sit there, and, and it makes us miserable. Because we're hearing the word, and you start, you start hearing the things, it's, it's, it's just a letter that contemns and tells you what you can't do, you shouldn't do the things you're doing, and you should be doing the things you're not doing. And when you're, when you're living in that state, that state and you're sitting there in that state, you're, just, you're, you're of men most miserable. Because you haven't yet received the Holy Ghost, His Spirit, to live it out through you. So it's this constant war within yourself, that, within ourselves, that, you know, it's, it's just you want to do right, but you find yourself doing wrong. And, and that's going to continue but when you get the Holy Ghost, it gives you the power to live it. That's right. And, it, and it, gives you, it gives you understanding of all these things. It, 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 it's not easy, but it, it makes more sense. Amen? When you have just the law, just the letter of the law, it's, it's just the, the, the blood of bulls and goats, and it, it could never actually take away that guilt of sin. And so you have that hunger, and you have that desire for sin, and to, to do the things that you ought not to do, and, and, and oftentimes you're yielding your vessel to it. But when you get the Holy Ghost, it says, no, it's, it's not the letter that's saying it's wrong, it's the Spirit of God that's saying it's wrong. And it's, it's the Spirit of God that'll say, hey, don't go there, don't do that, don't touch that thing, because that's going to burn you, that's going to hurt you. The difference between the two groups is the people... You know, you, 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 you'll, you'll sit there and you'll watch and you'll, you'll hear testimonies of people living a victorious life. And, and sometimes as you sit there, you're, you're, God's dealing with your heart and you're desiring that victory. That victory. You, you want to see that victory in your life. And what's the difference? It's the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit of Christ. You know, it's, I was thinking... Uh, I was thinking about just a visual of this, you know, don't, don't touch that and, and what that is. And we built some uh, flower boxes at the house and the neighbor has a horse and, and uh, I, I'll, I'll just step out from behind the pulpit. I hope it's okay to say poop. <laughs> but we went over and we got the, got the horse manure and we, we brought it back and, you know, you can't say manure to the kids because they don't quite understand that. So you know, Joey's right there, and he's helping me, and, and I'm shoveling it out and things, and one just kind of rolls off to the side, and Joey's looking at it. And I said, don't touch that, son. And he's looking at it, and I said, Joey, don't, that's yucky, don't touch it, you know. And he looks at it, and he says, that's the poop? And I said, yeah, that's, that's the poop, don't touch it. And so he bends down like this. I said, Joey, don't touch that, that's yucky. And he's looking at it, and he's looking at me, and I turn my back for two seconds, and I turn around, and what's Joey doing? I said, Joey, now you got to go wash your hands. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's, it's like the Holy Spirit does for us. He says, that's, that's, don't touch that. Don't pick that up. Don't touch that, that buddy, that, that stove, it's hot. Don't touch the hot stove, you're going to get burned, and... It, it's, like, it's like the poo. you got to touch it. you got to find out for yourself. <laughs> and then you get burned. But, you know, we, we take that as a, as a child, but, you know, we all, we've all done it. We all do it. You know, that, that warning, that it's such a sweet warning of the Holy Spirit that says, don't go there, don't do that. You know, and, and, it's, and it's like, and I've said this before here, so I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but, you know, I've had it in my life when, when 
even before temptation comes, the Holy Spirit's there to warn you. And, you know, so you're sitting there, and all of a sudden, something feels different. And you think, you know, it just makes your, your, your spiritual senses start tingling, <laughs> you know. And, and then all of a sudden, the temptation hits. And, ah, oh, okay, so now I know what that was. The Holy Spirit was warning me that this was coming. It, you know, really, it's, it's kind of cheating. <laughs> it's, like, it's like giving you the, the answer to the question before the question comes, right? And the Holy Spirit does that for us. Oh, how he loves us, amen? But this is, but this is what the devil does, is he, he entices and he tempts you until you sin. And then he'll, he'll use the word of God and he'll condemn you to hell by it. So he's the one telling you, do this, do this, do this, putting that temptation on you. And then you do it, and then he's right there to say, oh, buddy, you know, you're going to go to church tomorrow? You just did that last night, and you're going to go to church? You're going to sit there and try to worship and, and, and pray? You're going to pray to God? And God's the one saying that, he said, ask, confess it and I'm faithful and just to forgive you. It's, he's given us all the answers already. He's, he, he set this up so beautifully that you have to win. He's so determined. And, that, and that's why he sent his spirit. It wasn't good enough just to have the law, but he sends the spirit of the law so that we can live it. And... You know, as I said, we don't do away with the law. Just, well, just forget it then. That's not the answer. If I go as far as I can away from it, I'll feel better. But that's not it. That's not the right approach. Paul actually goes on to say that the law is good. Because like we said, you wouldn't know that that was wrong unless there was the law. So I don't want to keep uh, beating this, but hopefully I'm laying the foundation. The problem of it lies in the old sinful nature. So Paul, Paul writes about this and he gives us a key. And verse, chapter 7, verse 14. You got your Bibles with you? All right, we're going we're gonna to be turning, looking at them quite a bit. Why is there such a battle in ourselves? What is it? Paul writes, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Born in sin, shaped in iniquity, we come into the world speaking lies. You were, you were sold into sin. Adam gave up his rights. That's, the fall came through Adam and Eve, and that was, that was selling the birthright, so to speak. So now we, we know that the law is actually spiritual, but we're the problem. It's not the law. Paul says... We're the problem. It's this old, sinful, carnal nature. Verse 16. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. So the war within me, Paul says, is caused by the law, and sin proves the word is good and right. Because I want to do good, yet I find myself doing the things I hate. It was the word that showed me I was doing wrong to begin with. It's verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, and how to perform that which is good I find not. Paul says, I'm no good. And guess what? If Paul was no good, you're no good either. I know I'm not good. So maybe if some of you don't know you're no good, just let the preacher tell you tonight. You're no good. We're no good. I'm no good. There's nothing good within me in and of myself. I want to do right, but I just can't find the know-how to do it. Right? And, it's, and it just, it's this war. You can see how it just, it tears us up sometimes. Amen? Anyone else been there? Anyone else been there even with the Holy Ghost? Amen. Now we come to an important separation here, though. 
and why we shouldn't walk away from the word because of this war we feel. Let's read uh, verse 20 to the end. Chapter 7, verse 20. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Paul just separated it for us. Yeah, you're carnal. Yeah, the law is requiring this of us. But Paul, Paul says, but I'm desiring to do good. I, I want to live the word of God. I want to live this thing. I want, this, I want Jesus Christ expressed through my life. And even as much as I fail, and as much as I'm just, oh, he says, oh, wretched man that I am. He, he, he draws a line in the sand here. If, if that's in your heart, then it's not you that does it. It's the sin that dwells in you. 21, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. It's that inward. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? But then watch as, he, as, as our picture changes from, from a war and what feels like defeat within us to victory. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord so then that with, with the mind I find... Uh, I'm sorry. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. There's these two laws working within you. The law of God, the law of the Spirit, and the law of sin and death. They're, they're ever present with you. Brother Branham said it's a cockleburn nature. And, it, and it's with you until we get out of here, until this body changes. Amen? But I just love that. It's not me doing the wrong anymore. It's the sin that I'm stuck with in this flesh. And God has grace for that. Like we said, is that law to sin? Absolutely not. Is it law to yield your vessel to whatever you, whatever you want, whatever you desire? Absolutely not. We shouldn't make grace a disgrace. Amen? We shouldn't trample over the blood of Jesus Christ. We, we should use it to war. Amen? Use the blood of Jesus Christ to war. So let's go to chapter 8 now. And watch how beautiful this is. This, this is just, this is, I, I know I keep saying this, but it's just, it's a beautiful setup. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. No condemnation. How? Because the desire on the inside is to do right. To do the will of God by living out the word of God. Our opening scripture said, He that searches the heart. If he searches the heart, then he sees the desires to do right according to his word. And that's what he's looking at. It, it's, like, it's like he just says, I have an understanding. I understand what you're going through. But I'm, I'm not going to look at that. I'm going to look at this. I'm going to look at your desire. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst, for they shall be filled. What's a thirst? It's a desire. The young people laughed at me because one time I was talking about courtship and things, and I said, you know, you get a young girl or a young guy, and... and you know, they're thirsting for something. They're thirsting for a mate. And they all just thought that was hilarious because <laughs> thirsting after a man or a woman, it just sounds funny. So, <laughs> so it's a desire. <laughs> Verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. 
So these laws are warring within us, and yet there's a law in Jesus Christ that Jesus brought by going to the cross, by dying on the cross, and giving His Spirit back to us that really, I want to say it overrides the law of sin and death. Does that override your will? No, it doesn't. It gives you power to override the law of sin. It gives you power to override the temptation in your life. Amen? It gives us victory. So, verse 3, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. <coughs> God took care of it. That's how we're victorious. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So, this is, this is what grabbed my attention when I was reading the Scriptures. Are you okay with a Bible study tonight? Is this... this term that Paul keeps using of walking after the Spirit. He, he keeps saying it. Walk after the Spirit. Walk after the Spirit. Don't walk after the flesh. You know, it's... It, I need to come up with a better example. I can't say poo during the whole sermon. <laughs> but it, <laughs> but it's, 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 like the, it's like the horse manure. You know, quit... You know, Joey, quit walking towards the manure. Walk away from it. Get, get you know what, That's, it's sin. It's, it's the flesh. It's like manure, right? I mean, that's what it is. You know, sin is just, it's, it's an abomination before the Lord. It's, it's the stink. It's, it's just that putrefying smell that takes your breath away. That's what sin is like. So quit walking towards it. You say, I'm, I'm tired of living this way. Well, stop walking towards that. Walk the other way. Instead of going to this, you know, when, when the temptation comes, stop going towards it. Go the opposite direction. Change, change your focus. Change your atmosphere that you're in. Change the scenery. I love what Brother Boaz said. Take it to a different dimension. Go fight on your ground, not the devil's ground. When you, when you walk towards the manure pile, you're on Satan's ground. Amen? Walk towards God. So the law was still only dealing with the flesh. We needed something to go deeper into the soul where the nature of sin was and deal with that nature. The law of the spirit of life that was in Christ, Jesus Christ gives us overcoming, prevailing power against the law of sin and death. So... Paul keeps emphasizing this. Walk after the Spirit. So let's read 15. We're going to read a little, read on through here. <coughs> Excuse me. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. It's exactly what we're saying. When you walk after when you walk towards that temptation, you're minding that temptation. You're, you're being obedient to it. You're giving yourself to it. But he says, walk after the Spirit. When you're, when you're not, I'm not talking about, you know, that, that saying you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. I, I'm not talking about something like that, but I'm talking about an overcoming prevailing power. Walk after the Spirit. You know, Think on the Scripture. Get into the Word. You know, do those things that you know to do. It's, it's, it's not as complicated as we make it. Amen? Usually when we make it complicated, it's because we're wanting to go play in the manure. Right? This is a terrible sermon. <laughs> For to be carnally minded is death. This is why. To be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So we got this war that's within us. And Paul's saying, are you tired of warring? 
You want peace? You want life? Then walk after the Spirit. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. <clears throat> so then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You want to please God. But we get into the flesh. And, and listen, I, I don't want, I'm not preaching uh, absolute perfection here. Okay? We repent, we make it right, we get it under the blood, and we go on. We go on to the Spirit. The Spirit's over here. We go on walking after the Spirit. Amen? But, you know, I thought of this today too. Sometimes we give ourselves permission to get into the flesh. Well, they treated me wrong, so I'm going to fly off the handle at them. I'm justified by it, bless God, because they treated me bad. Well, this just says that when you walk after the flesh, you're not pleasing God. So, you know, I think as much as it, you know, you fight against it, I think anyone would admit when you get in the flesh, okay, yeah, I got in the flesh, right? And that's not pleasing to God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So how do you get into the body of Christ? You're baptized into it. I'm not talking about water baptism, but baptism of the Spirit. Amen? But don't throw out water baptism now. See, you got you to gotta bring the balance on these things, because if someone's struggling with it, they'll say, oh, well, preacher gave me permission. No, I'm not giving you permission. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for remission of sin, and ye shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Verse 10, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised of Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. See, I want to go to verse 17. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. There's no bondage in Jesus Christ. And, you know, go out, go away, and say this was bondage. But that's because you were still living after the law of the flesh. You wanted the things of the flesh, and so that war was in you. And so that's why you felt in bondage. And that's why you feel free out there. You get the spirit, and you realize that this is freedom. Amen? But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. I love this scripture. Because when the minister's preaching, regardless of how sinful you feel, your heart, something that the minister is saying is connecting with your heart, it's resonating on the inside that this is truth. <clears throat> this is how I want to live. This is how I want to be. Right here, he says, the Spirit itself bears witness. That's the Spirit bearing witness that you are Jesus Christ's. You belong to Him. You might not be where you want to be. You might not be living like, like the, the next brother sitting next to you yet. But we're all at different stages. We're all growing into maturity. Amen? So keep, keep walking after the Spirit. Attend to the things of the Spirit because as you attend to it, as you, as you feed on the things that are spiritual, you gain spiritual strength. You start growing in the Spirit. Amen? <clears throat> And if children, then heirs. Uh, did I miss 16? The Spirit itself bears witness. Okay. 
that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be gl also glorified together. You're, you're that, that spirit that's connecting with your spirit, the spirit of God, that's, you, it, it opens you up. It's saying you have availability to everything that Jesus Christ had. You have availability to the power that he had, to the authority that he had, as Brother Paul's been preaching. You have authority. You have complete, the, the, the checkbook is, is blank, it's signed, and the funds are in the bank. All you have to do is write out the check. That's it. You have access to everything that Jesus Christ had access for. So <clears throat> I started to go into this a little bit more, walking after the Spirit, and I realized, you know, it was really all preached on Sunday. So I'm going to say, insert Sunday sermon here. <laughs> so go back and catch it if you didn't, or if you just want to hear a good sermon again. Amen? Because it's, it's coming under the headship of, of the Word, coming under that headship of the Spirit is what he was talking about. Amen? And that's, that's it's, it's walking after the Spirit. It's doing the things that, that turn you towards the Spirit. But I just thought of a little bit of a picture here. Walking after the Spirit is about how you position yourself. What direction you place the opening of your tent and I'm going to change that to say the opening of your senses. Not just, not just these, but your mind, your imagination. What, what direction are you pitching your senses towards? Lot pitched his tent to the door so that the door opened towards Sodom and Gomorrah. So when Abraham and Lot split up, there was war between them, right? Right? One was carnal, one was spiritual. So they had to divide. They had to split. Let's not war between us. Abraham said, Lot, you go choose what direction you want to go, and I'll take the other one. And Lot said, well, I want to go down towards Sodom and Gomorrah. And it wasn't just that he went down. This is the manure pile. It just wasn't that he went down and he, he put his tent there but he actually set it so that the opening of it was facing the city. So you can imagine that every morning when Lot got up and his wife got up and they went out on the porch of the tent to have their coffee, what did they walk out and see first thing in the morning? It was Sodom and Gomorrah. It was the direction that all their senses, it wasn't just the tent door, it was all their senses were opening up to that first thing in the morning. Abraham, on the other hand, pitched his tent in the direction that God was going to come. Amen? He pitched his tent. Think about this. So I need, I need more stage. <laughs> Abraham pitched his tent so that the opening was the direction that God was going to come walking. Because if you remember the scripture, when he stepped out and he was drinking coffee in the morning in the door of his tent, it was from that direction that he was facing that God actually was walking towards him. Amen? Lot, with the direction that his tent was facing, wouldn't have known that the destruction was coming because it was coming from behind him. He was facing the manure pile and being drawn towards the flesh, being drawn towards the, the law of the flesh, the things that would, would cause the fleshly desires to be enticed, he was facing it. But what he didn't realize is the same direction that Abraham's tent was facing, God was coming from this direction, and yet that's the same direction that destruction was coming from. So we really, it's, 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 I want you to take away tonight that it's very important what direction you're pitching your tent. What direction you're allowing your senses, what are you feeding on? What are you allowing yourself to intake first thing in the morning? When you, when you get out of bed and you get out of your tent and you go to drink your coffee, what are you looking at? 
Amen? What's your mind going to? What are you, what are you watching? What are you listening to? What are you allowing your thoughts to dwell on? I don't know about you, but I thought that was really good. Abraham pitched his tent the direction God was going to come. Sometimes it's just as simple as putting a filter on your phone. Well, that's childish, brother. I'm a man. Quit acting like a boy. Right? Quit acting like a boy. Put the filter on your phone if you need a filter. Give somebody access to go through your phone if you're struggling. Put, it, put the filter on the tablet or the computer. Maybe, maybe it's as simple as deleting an app or deleting the game or throwing away the book or the magazine or the CDs or the movies. Say, well, boy, all of those are on my phone nowadays. I ain't throwing that away. Well, get rid of them. Get rid of them. It, it's, it's, it's that simple. You're, you're setting yourself up for failure every day if you leave it there. <clears throat> Maybe it's deleting accounts or it's unsubscribing. You know, you can block websites from your Internet browser. You can do that. And I know that you can go in and shut them off too. But it, it might make you think twice, right? Maybe if, you're, if you turned your direction towards the things of God, you'd see Jesus Christ running after you. You'd see him wanting to fill you with your spirit more than even you want it. You know, I think of the prodigal son. It wasn't just that the father saw him afar off and he started walking to him. It was the father was, you know, girding up the loins and taking off. He was, he was hightailing it to the son. And if we just turn our focus to that direction, we would realize that Christ, that's what we're talking about tonight. That's what I'm trying to, that's, that's the beauty that I keep saying. If I could just, I just see it as a beautiful picture of God dropping everything that he had, everything that he could call glorious and that made him God from the very beginning. He dropped it all to run after you and I. And if you just turn your focus to God, you'd see him running after you. You know, you're, you're going this way. You're running, hightailing it towards the things of the flesh. But you, you, if you just look over your shoulder, at least, you'd see Jesus Christ running after you trying to catch you, trying to pull you back and say, no, 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 there's something better over here. It's a lot less stinky over there. So let's open up, go to James 1 and verse 5. Because I want to make this as simple as I believe that it is. If I can find James. James 1 and verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men, say it with me, liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. You have need of something in your life? You want the Spirit of God? You want more of the Spirit of God? Ask Him. Because this says He gives it liberally. Not, not, just, not just, you know, I ain't got nothing to give you, Gideon. Here. <laughs> it's not just, here, Gideon. Here, Gideon. God says, no. Here, Gideon, spend all you want. Won't get you too far, but you can spend all you want. <laughs> but with God, it'll take you far. It'll take you, it'll just ask him, and he gives it liberally. Gives you liberally the spirit. He's wanting to give it to you more than you want it. Brother Paul said Sunday, he said, we bring our lives under the word. Position yourself to receive it. It's as simple as reading your Bible 
and praying. Don't make that, listen, that's not a law. Men, men can take that and make it a law that, oh my goodness, I gotta, I gotta read. I gotta read the whole book of James today. And tomorrow it's gotta be the book of Matthew. And, and the next day, and the next day. What if it's one scripture? Just take one scripture and ponder on it. Amen? Just, it's, it's not complicated. Just read your Bible and pray. And you say, well, why do I got to do that? Well, if I wrote you a letter or I sent someone to tell you a secret that would change your life, I gave Gideon my wallet and I said, Gideon, there's only so much on that card, but I'm going to send you a secret. And I write it down on a piece of paper that there's a million dollars that he can deposit into the same account that that card draws from. And I give him the piece of paper. If Gideon stuffed that in his pocket and he never read it, it'd do him no good. If I wrote you a letter that would change your life, or if I sent a messenger to give you a message and tell you this very secret, you would have to listen to that messenger or read that letter in order to get the benefit of what I was telling you. Amen? So it's not a law. There's a benefit in doing it. Just get into it. Just ask him. Just talk to him. Just, just love him. And accept his love for you. Amen? We're almost done. Let's go to Galatians 5. There's a glare on the clock back there, so I really can't tell what time it is. <laughs> so we'll just keep going. Why can't I find it? Here we go. Galatians 5, verse 16. We'll read to 18. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. <laughs> Paul just makes this easier and easier. You don't want to, you want to get away from the law of the flesh? Walk in the Spirit. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. How beautiful. Let's skip to 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So you can say you live in the Spirit all you want, but if you live in the Spirit, really live in it, you walk in the Spirit every day. Amen? You got those quotes up there? Just a couple of quotes. I'm coming down to a close. Did you, have you gotten something out of tonight? I'm just going to start reading and you catch me if you can. Did you say what? All right, I'm just going to start reading. Now to restore back his kinship, to bring back, now he had to let them get lost. You understand it. He had to let them sin, put them on free moral. Now, I had a Jehovah Witness one time come to the house. And normally I try to avoid them. <laughs> But I thought, I'm going to step out and talk to him this time. I'm just curious. And uh, so they, they, somehow we got on the fall. And I can't remember exactly what I said, but they gasped. And they said, you mean to tell me that you believe God knew that they would fall? God wouldn't do that. And he can't be God. And I'm thinking, if God didn't know that they would do that, he's not God, right? I mean... If he's God, he's got to know it. But, but watch us now. So don't, don't let this stumble you that, that God had to let them get lost. But watch how he did it. He had to let them sin, put them on free moral. He could not make them sin and remain God and then punish them for something he had them, made them do. But when he put man on partnership with him. Now I love this because 
Brother Paul brought it out that Adam and Eve, Satan, when he came to Eve, he said, but if, if you take of this tree, he said, you shall be gods. Brother Paul said, they were already gods. And this is God, God made man partners with him. Not, not less, not more, partners, equal partners. They were gods. But when he put man on partnership with him, then let man act as a free moral agent. See, the same thing he's got you on today. See, see, you act any way you want to. You're a free moral agent. So therefore, if he put the first like that, he has to put the second like that. He has to put everyone like that, or he acted wrong in the first place. See, but everybody is on the same basis. Do you have that next one? And the very thing that man fell and become lost, he become the savior. So you have this fall because of free moral agency. But then this is saying he, he's going to do the exact same thing. And the very thing that man fell and become lost, he become the savior of that, taking his own law. And he could not do it as that great Jehovah that covered all space, time. See, he couldn't do it. And he had to become a man. And he took kinship with the man that was lost. Amen? And become a man. God made flesh. God became, uh, God became from God to become me to take, to take my sin upon him that he might make me him. Amen? Back to his great purpose of sons and daughters of God, for he is the eternal father. He became me that I might become him. Amen? Let's do that last one. It's not expressions of some church that we should express something. It's a life that you don't live yourself. It takes the pressure off of you. But he comes in you and lives by himself. How? By the Spirit. And you become a prisoner to any human intellectual being at all. You're led by the Spirit. And how do you know? And then skipping down. But if you have the mind of Christ, Christ... Christ expresses himself through you, shows that it's him and, not, and it's not you. You've not lost your mind. And then he, he talks about that a little bit, but he says, but a real man is to lose his own thoughts and his own thinking, not come up blindly. So he's trying to, he's trying to explain this. So don't let this confuse you. It's not just that you become a robot. It's not just you, you lose your mind completely and, you know, we're all insane. But he says, it's not something you come blindly. You lose your thoughts, as in you lay your thoughts down and you take his thoughts up. No, sir, you come up with your right senses and Christ takes you over and expresses himself. And now to the world, you're an insane person. But when Christ takes you over, he'll express that word right through you because it's him. He is the word, see? And then you can see the expression of Christ, not some illusion of some sort, but a real genuine Christ expressing himself right through you. How beautiful. Amen. You can stand to your feet. This, this war that's within us, and it's warring, and we feel it. We feel it at times and seasons in our life. We feel it when temptation comes. What is it? It's that law of sin trying to come back and cause you to war within yourself. But if you just give over to the Word and you take God's thoughts, what's God's thoughts? His Word. You take God's thoughts, and it just does away with that. It, 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 if, if you'll just pitch your tent towards Jesus Christ, towards the Spirit. Walk after the Spirit then. Then it does away with it. And then Christ expresses Himself through you. Amen? Amen. Gideon, I, as much as I want to try to sing, I just can't. Let's, let's bow our heads and pray, and I'll turn it over to these guys and girls. Heavenly Father, we, we just love you tonight. And Lord, I just pray, God, that the people could see, Father, how, how you set up this plan of redemption and 
and how you just said it, Lord, so that your spirit just completely does everything. Not everything in the sense of pushing us through a pipe and pulling us out the other side, but all the tools are there. And all we have to do is yield to it. So Father, I, I pray it's, it's simple. And yet, Lord, it's, it truly is a war at times. Because, because we are carnal, Lord, in our, in our own flesh. Because we still have that flesh nature, these flesh-born bodies, born in sin. Lord, that war is ever-present with us, as Paul said. But I'm so glad that Paul didn't just leave it there. But Lord, your word says that the word of God was written by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. So that same spirit that wants to indwell us and help us to make it, to help us to, to be victorious lives and to let you express yourself through us, that same spirit moved upon Paul to write these things. That even going back to our opening scripture, when we don't even know what to pray. Sometimes, Lord, I've, I've been in prayer and, and all that I know, Lord, is that I need, I need help. I don't know exactly what that looks like. I don't know what that is, but I just know that I need, I need you. And I need the help and the strength of your spirit. Father, even when we don't know, your word says that the Spirit will intercede for us. I think, Lord, maybe we'll sing it later as I think, listen to our hearts. Father, because we lack words so many times. God, even when I say I love you, Lord, it, it just doesn't feel just doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like enough. If somebody's struggling here tonight, God, then Lord, I just pray, Father, let your spirit come on the scene. Fill that person, Lord. Maybe they just lift it, lift their hands to you now to let them know that they need you. Lord, my hands lifted, Lord, I need you. I, I want to live, Lord, like Christ lived. I want to I wanna walk after the Spirit. I want the Spirit to lead me. I want the Spirit to take my vocal cords and, and speak. I, I want to, Lord, I hope it's not wrong to say, I, I want to see visions, Lord. I want to I wanna lay hands on the sick and then be recovered. But Lord, even more than that, I want to live an overcoming life. Those things are good, but Father, what is it without a life to back it up? I pray, God, that tonight it would be the power and demonstration that was preached and that you would just take control now of every vessel. We love you, Lord. Help us, God. When temptation comes on, your word promised you'd give, you gave a way of escape. Let us turn to your way, Lord. Help us to just simply yield to you. We love you. Bless our pastor and his family as they're out resting. I just pray that they would come home refreshed and just have blessed memories together. And, and I pray, God, watch over the flock, Lord. While the shepherd's away, Lord, I know Brother Paul would say it's the Holy Ghost that leads the church. So that same Holy Ghost that leads the shepherd, Father, I pray you'd lead us now. So watch over us, Lord. Keep us safe naturally and spiritually until we can meet again. We love you. Lord, let your people be encouraged. I pray they're encouraged tonight. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.